Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. It's Monday morning, 9 o'clock. We've had already, I think, two and a half really exciting days. Uh, but obviously, there's more to come, and we're really thrilled to start out again with our digital studies group. It's something that we've been presenting over the years, every time at the Annual Scholars Conference. It's a kind of collective work that we are doing at the Ackerman Center um, with a number of students who have a tendency of graduating, and then we always have to find ourselves some new talent, but I think that's life. Um, I will kind of quickly introduce our team that is mostly actually presenting today. You can see um, all of the names already here on the list, but the, um, on, the, on the PowerPoint, but the part that I really want you to um, look at is that the individuals that we're drawing together are not all from the humanities, but in many ways, Sidan is an MS business analytics student, and then Angie Simmons is a historian. And Katie is actually an art artist, and then Sata is an MS information technology management student again. So diversity and interdisciplinarity is kind of at the heart of this project. The other part is, is a very simple realization that in many ways, as we were listening to our two keynote speakers yesterday in the morning and in the evening, we started to get a simple understanding of how the various types of questions and sources really truly can overwhelm our ability to make sense out of that. And while this is very much the case with a three minute reel of a home video, it is in other ways also obviously the case with the vast amount of big data that the Holocaust has left in its aftermath. So how do we make sense really, not just out of individual documents, photos, or even short movies, but how do we make sense out of thousands of thousands, if not um, of entries? And so this has been really at the heart of this um, endeavor of the digital studies pro project to find a way how we can scale really up and down the, the kind of the quantities of data and hopefully um, interpret them. The second part that is equally important, and I think this came out yesterday in David Patterson's comments, but also in Michael Berenbaum's, is that students who are engaged in Holocaust studies are grappling with big questions. But I think the other corollary to this is that they also have increasingly become participants in what we call the knowledge production and not any longer just a recipient of. We're looking at a new generation that is not entirely happy any longer just to sit in the back of the classroom and to have us pontificate what they ideally have to write down and, and memorize, but in many ways grappling with the meaning of the Holocaust is also empowering them to participate in, the, in that process and also to have their own voices in that. And I think nowhere better to do this than really with something that overtly seems to be almost so hermetically sealed from our ability to make sense out of it, either because of the nature of the, of the documents or of the sheer quantity. So what we're presenting today is actually on the Dachau prisoner lock, about 160,000 entries of endless names and dates and categories, which when you look at it as a traditional historian, you're immediately overwhelmed just by the sheer amount and it's virtually impossible for you to kind of, kind of dis, dis, um, see any kind of patterns in that. But before I go into the, our specific case study or our team will actually, I'm just warming up the room, so to speak, for them. Um, I'm just giving you a little bit of a broader introduction into the broader scope of the project itself. Some of you have seen these earlier iterations, so I'll go very quickly. But suffice it to say that earlier parts of this project were intent on mapping out deportation patterns, in particular focused on Western Europe, as a way of understanding how, within the context of the changing world of the Second World War, deportations, however, continued to occur and were respectively adjusted to the kind of opportunities that existed. In many ways, we created then this kind of, it's a version of this um, that is life, and you at any given point, we can demonstrate this later, you can kind of go into it, you can select a different destination, a different year, a different month, you can group it together and so on and so forth. And then this is in a PowerPoint, so this is actually not quite live, but if you hover over it, it's kind of interactive and you can see the numbers. In other words, it kind of gives students really an opportunity to directly reach into the documents and kind of 
to try to ask also their questions and see what, it, what this database yields and how, it um, and how it visualizes it. But on the other side of that scale of the massive data and the massive entries is also the individual story. And so our website that we've over the years have developed as a teaching and research tool is also equipped really to deal with the individual story that we find sometimes in the documents of the perpetrators which allow us simply to map out one individual story like we've done in this case um, and kind of to give a little bit of geography to it. This one scales actually all the way down into the streets of Amsterdam where you can kind of see the movement around. The one though that we want to focus on is really Dachau today. Uh, for a variety of reasons, Dachau has attracted our attention, partly um, because it's the, it's the first bigger camp that is established. It's the camp that stays open the longest. It is a camp, like Martin told us yesterday, that is kind of the training ground for many of the other um, eventual infamous individuals who got their training at Dachau. Dachau is also infamous and tied to the Kristallnacht and the imprisonment. And Dachau, last but not least, is one of the kind of larger camps that gets liberated by the, Brit uh, by the American and therefore is really inscribed into our memory. And it's last but not least also one of the camps of which there are physical remains that to this day are important site of memory. It's also a place that to this day attracts a certain amount of controversy. Um, one part in particular attracts considerable amount always, and this is a question as to whether there were gas chambers actually at Dachau. This goes back to an old article of faith by, held by many German historians that gas chambers did not exist in any of the camps in the quote, interior of the German Reich, but only on the eastern front. But the physical structures that you can encounter in Dachau tell a slightly different story. So let me just move on to this kind of you know, I think also when you're in the site itself, you see this in this picture, this kind of symmetry, which is like overwhelming. It's this kind of architecture of power um, where really this camp system was for the first time established. These are two photos of how nowadays you see kind of the emptiness, so to speak, where the barracks once existed, but you still have a sense of the vastness of that space. We're moving now into our actual case studies of sorts. Here you can see the messiness, so to speak, of the original data. It looks a little bit like a telephone book that was thrown into, for those of you who still remember what telephone books are, look like. Um, sorry to date myself there. But it's, in other words, something that is very unstructured uh, and requires a tremendous amount of care and attention, like uh, our digital uh, team knows or something that goes in their parlance under the word of cleaning, data cleaning. Never thought that you can clean data, but, but apparently you can. Uh, we're just switching now to the actual site. I actually don't know how to get this up there. Cindy, can you help me for a second? Part of, you know, just to buy Katie a little bit of time of, of what we've been doing about Dachau is it started out initially with our interest in doing something about Kristallnacht as a way of commemorating it, and so we wanted to see something about the imprisonment of Jews in 1938. The second part was um, Glenn and Martin had endured already our podcast powers yesterday. We've been you know, doing podcasts right out of the middle of the pandemic, and one of the special podcasts we did was actually with Katie being here in Dallas and me walking around in, in Dachau and describing what I saw. So this is another kind of study, so to speak, of Dachau. This digital study today is a second one, and then we're working on a kind of slightly more artistic engagement with it as well. But here we are. Uh, this is now our kind of newest version. This is, as you can see, the total number of records on the upper side, over 660,000. Um, this is built around, which was a big change for us, that we were able to do a couple of years to move our existing studies onto this new platform called Power BI which in lots of ways you are somewhat familiar with insofar as you know Excel. And so this is Excel on steroids, or however you want to put it. Something that business majors are very familiar with and use all the time to analyze things, but something that we haven't used as much in the humanities, but which is really for us 
a great platform because at our university, all, uni all students immediately have access to Office 365, meaning they have free access to this platform. It can be embedded in Microsoft Teams meetings, so it's very flexible. But what it does now, and Katie will do the demonstration a little bit, is that you can very quickly see kind of the, the increase of the prisoner population um, just over the years. You can kind of see also the kind of categories that early on mattered. If we just kind of zoom in for a moment, maybe on 33. Uh, see, it's always easier said than done. Um, but what you could see, like for example, that the categories of imprisonment dramatically changed. So early on, the ones that stand out on top of it is political detention, preventive custody, race defiler, and so on and so forth. If you move into after 38, all of a sudden the geographic location, respectively, of the prisoners becomes more meaningful, that they came from Poland or from the Soviet Union. In other words, the imprisonment is, is more around the context of war. And the kind of category of them being Jewish on and off has a certain significance. But like Martin already told us yesterday, the number of Jewish prisoners in the camp system, in particular in the interior of the German Reich, after Kristall, not after the release of many of the prisoners, but actually quite low. So that the bigger numbers of Jewish prisoners in Dachau are really more the history of 1944. But what we are trying to do today is kind of to lead you a little bit through this process so you can see how Katie ever so cleverly manipulates the entries and kind of moves them up and down. But you can see all the way on the one side the bigger visualization, the band and its color coding and its changes. But also if you want to, you have always directly access to the data that is actually behind it, meaning the individual names. And so you can also click on those as well. So one of the kind of test tests that we did um, the other day was 1938. We wanted to look at the individuals who were imprisoned after Kristallnacht. And we have a board member who is not with us today, Ron Schwarz. His great grandfather was from Ludwigshafen. He was in prison. Fritz uh, Schwarz was his name. And he is in this, I'm sorry, this is a little harder to find his individual name this quickly, but of course he's in this database. He was imprisoned in November and then released in, in uh, February of 1939. So you can kind of very quickly jump from the, from the vast number of, of individual prisoners all the way down to, to the smaller ones. Within this bigger category of prisoners at Dachau, there were a couple that... Um, attracted in particular our attention. Um, and that kind of explains the different presentations that you're going to hear in a moment. Uh, one of them has to do really with 1938 um, and understanding also the extent to which Dachau very quickly starts to service also the recently annexed Austria. And so you very quickly start to understand that the Dachau population of prisoners has a lot to do with Vienna and Graz in particular as well as our particular interest in, in a very specific group, and that's the group that was charged under what is called the Article 175. In other words, men that were imprisoned for the alleged crime of having been gays. And so that's another group that we're tracking in there, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit more widely about that project. But what I, what I want you to kind of take away from it, that each one of these that Katie is clicking on is a way for you constantly to change what is visible at any given point. So the year, the categories, the month, and so on and so forth is something that you can kind of constantly change and thereby really ask interesting questions. Questions as to, for example, how these kind of categories that early on operate, that you know the 33, or well, here we are in the war categories, but the 33 categories, how do they become, they're initially about political opponents, like Martin told us, but at which point do some of these categories also acquire a certain racial inflection? And we see this, you know, in, in ways, I think, quite clearly, actually, in our 1938 uh, data before Kristallnacht. But, like I said, I'm just warming up the room. The real stars are yet to come, so I'm handing over. Sorry to kick you off the stage, Dr. Romer. There's not enough chairs for you. 
What I'm going to do is try to open up this visualization and the data a little bit for, uh, a little bit more by looking at a particular category. But I want to just quickly show you again this kind of jumbled. So when we first came across the data, this is what it looked like when we web scrapped it. And these two gentlemen are going to talk a bit more about that process. It's not my area of expertise. Um, but as Dr. Romer was saying, this can be quite hard from, you know, looking at it from his, a historical perspective to make sense of this. What is the story in this data? And that's really what the visualization is doing. It's helping tell that story in a way that can make a little bit more sense and also so that we can ask deeper questions, particularly about the category, which is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but I just want to point out a couple of areas in this image. So obviously we have the date names, and then you'll see here this SCHPOL, this is the category. And within this little uh, indicator, that's where we get this sort of expansive um, ribbon part of the visualization. And as I was doing it while Dr. Romer was speaking, I was changing this tree map so that it reflects in the data. And then we can start to ask particular questions of this larger visualization. So this particular part is pulling from the entire data set that we have, which is 166 uh, individuals that are listed. I should also say that is not everyone who was held at Dachau. This is just, we're just making a visualization about the records that we have, continuing the work of others who took it from you know, the handwritten or um, typed Nazi record. They digitized it and we made this visualization. But looking at the category of individuals held under the assumption of homosexual activity, this uh, paragraph 175 was the law that prohibited this. And you can see in this larger data set that it's really just a whisper. It's just a tiny little thread here running throughout the years. So we took that and made a visualization just dedicated to those individuals whose story can typically be lost in the larger narrative of the Holocaust. So we're just looking at 280 men. And keeping with the theme of this conference, I wanted to point out a few trends, particularly 1933, 1938, and 1943. But something that struck me in asking this question of how did those years and changes within the war affect this particular uh, group of individuals? Um, initially, it doesn't look like it did, right? There's not a huge spike in people uh, being brought into Dachau during those years. And also, you can see here the spread of where they were coming from, where they were being arrested. It's not really affected by those years. But what does change with the flow of their being brought into Dachau is actually the status, meaning in what way did they leave Dachau. And we could find that information uh, because of this jumbled mess. There's a, a part of that in the, doc in the records that says their disposition or what is the status on exiting. And that's where this part here comes into play. So I'll just first... Um, point out the released, which is this purple part. So between 1933-34, really the last person was released in 40, 42, but the bulk of people stopped being released in 1938. So that means men were being brought into the prison system, into the camps, and it was no longer just sort of um, serving a prison sentence and then being let go. But we do start to see an increase in people being transferred. And then the last thing I wanted to note is people being liberated. So of the 280 men who were held at Dachau under violation of Section 175, 43 of them were liberated in 45 by Allied forces. And this section is part of what I'm doing deeper research in. And what's really interesting about some of them is under this um, section you can see we have a longer list of camps that are listed for some of them. And it's really interesting when you get into this sort of granular, 
look at the data, how often individuals were transferred from one camp to the next, and in some cases back to Dachau. So there's a few cases. One individual was taken to three different camps and then brought back to Dachau where he was eventually liberated from. And this is not really a good explanation for why the Nazis are moving people around with this kind of intensity. Uh, the next thing I want to do is hand it off to Sadat, who's going to talk a little bit more about how we got the data. Uh, maybe at the end, we're going to open it up to questions for everyone. Thank you, though. For you want to hold it? You want to put it here? I'll put it here. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Siddhant, and currently I have been associated with Ackerman Center for past eight months. So, uh, to uh, it's been six years or more than that, and uh, to the scale of the data has increased immensely. So it is our duty to maintain that data and keep the data in a format for that uh, to the visualization that you have seen. My role of data analysis is divided into three parts. First is data gathering, another is data cleaning, and the third is data visualization. Like you, you have seen, uh, we, uh, there were few web sources and governmental archives from where we scrapped our data. And uh, uh, once we scrap our data, uh, we compiled it or uh, compiled it from different web source and appended it through running various Python scripts. And uh, after converting that into an Excel form so that we can clean the data in more proper way to get more insights. Talking about the data cleaning part, the first thing is to remove duplicate values. Since we are getting data from different web sources, what happens is uh, the data is represented multiple times. In order to remove that data, uh, that is the first step to remove the duplicate values so that we don't get any false indication or the insights that we are not looking for. Once the duplicate is removed, uh, then comes the format part. Uh, I'm the, since different web sources have different formats of uh, storing the data, the date format is different. Sometimes it's uh, in the month form and year form, or else it's year, month, and day. So we, what we do is we make that in a similar format so that it is easy for us to visualize that part. Once that is done, uh, to make data more clean and uh, to improve the longevity of the data, what we do is we make data in a similar format. Uh, we remove extra spaces, we remove full stops, we uh, remove all the caps locks so that uh, whenever a person or an individual is trying to see the data, uh, it is, uh, they are able to understand data more clearly and uh, and uh, since the format of the data is not similar at all. So what happens is uh, we have to make sure that the data is in the similar format, which makes it easy for us to visualize it. So to talk more about the visualization, I will pass on to the Sathar. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarthak, and as Dr. Romer uh, introduced me, I'm part of the Information Technology Management course here at uh, UT Dallas. Uh, wanted to also go in uh, deep about the category column that Katie also was talking about a lot. And <clears throat> the interesting part about it was initially we couldn't you know, figure out much about it. Like we thought that it was just probably some error in the data, in fact. Uh, but you know, in, in researching more and going through different uh, archives and sources on the web, we figured out that uh, each one of uh, the category columns made sense. And yeah, if you could, that would be great, thanks. Okay, um, so the uh, interesting part is that it just seems like a few letters. And what we had to figure out was that, okay, is it's written R, and then uh, versus it's written RA. So could that mean two different things? And yes, it did. Um, going into uh, sources that scholars had compiled over the years, 
And there's like documents which are like 350 pages long with how uh, the Third Reich used to categorize people uh, to understand where they're coming from, what sort of uh, arrest it was, and uh, most importantly, if they were Jewish or not. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> yes, uh, so like for an example, uh, one of the uh, categories would be like R, and the other would be RA. So the R would mean Russian, or uh, USSR, and RA would be race defiler. So two completely different things, but it's just a difference of one letter that we had to delicately um, encode, uh, decode, in fact, to, uh, in our visualization where we can now see that uh, there is much more to the story. Uh, also, how we worked to this was we used uh, Python and Excel scripts so that whenever there is uh, a letter that, is, that uh, has to uh, do with what it means. For example, uh, here you can see like there is a DR in the first uh, category. So that would mean a uh, person belonging to Germany, Austria. Uh, I think one most important thing also was that <clears throat> the sort of uh, uh, research and sort of, you know, discussions that we had to go into decode this was a great process and the scripts were long, uh, as well, a uh, lot of time that had to be invested in this. So, and you know, the most important thing at the end was the insight that we got, uh, was that, like for example here, you can see that uh, first they are uh, categorized as simply prisoners, but towards the, towards, oh, one second, yeah, yeah. going towards the second part, you could see that they now, uh, are categorizing them as security service of the SS. So they're sort of shifting from, you know, just being police arrests to arrests made by the SS or the army. And, and that's my part. Thanks. Uh, Angie will take over now. Bring that down a bit because I'm shorter than my colleagues. Um, okay, so I am the historian on the project and I have um, just recently joined. Um, I've been working on other projects for the Ackerman Center, but I was brought in to kind of um, help out with kind of decoding the data here, looking at the patterns and turning it back into a story about people. So what I do is after everybody, these, this wonderful team, has gone through and created these visualizations is I take a look at the visualizations and search for patterns. And then I take those patterns and I try and reconcile them with what we already know on the historical record. Um, so for example, um, I've been working particularly on the year 1938. And what we know about 1938, or what we previously thought we knew about 1938, is that there would be a large deportation record for November of that year after the November pogrom. However, upon examining the data, I saw that actually there was a much larger deportation record for June of that year. So then I had to go back and search and figure out what happened in June of that year. Why are the numbers significantly greater? And by significantly greater, I mean there were 1,500 deportations to Dachau in November and 2,500 in June, so significantly greater. So what I did was I went back and like the historian that I am, I do research. And I searched in the historical record and I found that just after uh, the annexation of Austria in 1938, uh, there was a program that was uh, implemented by Heinrich Himmler that targeted what he called the work indolent, or those that were believed to be quote unquote lazy. And those people who had either quit jobs within a short amount of time or had been fired from jobs or had not applied for jobs or whatever it might have been, um, were targeted, arrested, and deported to Dachau in the months 
right after the annexation, but most um, significantly in the month of June. So that's the number that we were seeing, and that, that's why we were seeing that there was this difference between what we knew about in November, because that's the story that we hear mo most often, and what the story that we hadn't really talked about a lot in June. So what I do then is after looking for the patterns, reconciling it with a historical record, then I try to humanize it. I go to the data itself and I look at particular names and then I take those names and I try to find them in places like the Show of Foundation, um, you know, if they're survivors, or look for them anywhere else that I can find them. And then for some of these cases, we write um, case studies where we look at the life of that particular person. So taking it from the big picture, which we created, back down to the individual and humanizing it. So then, that's it. That's what I do. Coming back to this jump in June, um, and I suggested that earlier already, has a lot to do really with Austria and the recent annexation. But part of what is also interesting is within this group of those that were overtly uh, brought to Dachau because their unwillingness to work, there was an overlap between that kind of category and them also increasingly being Jewish. And so that's, I think, one of the interesting parts that we can track here, that we can see how certain categories of the kind of larger Nazi policy of engineering an Aryan society that is about um, idolizing certain types of you know, work ethics and this and that and the other and incarcerating political opponents or those deemed as asocial are also increasingly getting racially inflected. And so how that comes something that really increasingly also shapes the population of the prisoners. Let me just also emphasize one or two other things that may have otherwise kind of got lost. When the two of them talked about the cleaning of the data, then remember always, how do you clean actually 160,000 entries, right? So they were really sweet and, and quick about it. They had to write code. I mean, they, they didn't make every little name shiny by itself because then this would have taken another 10 years or so, but they actually had to write code to make this more efficient. So this is number one. The other one, this you know, visualization that you're seeing here is kind of custom made for whatever we want. So you can kind of at any point alternate, so to speak, the different windows and they can show you different types of things. What we then do with those as well, is if you don't mind, um, if you show the 1938 example, uh, whenever we feel that we've accomplished something, we write a little news story. And so we, oh. you know, write a you know, story about 1938 where we kind of analyze the data and what it suggests to us, and then we publish it you know, on social media and so on and so forth. The other component, which is, and you see all these various case studies that we've done over the years. And so this, you know, most of it is really the more recent iterations that are based on this Power BI. Um, but the other part that we are just about really to begin is to introduce this into our classes and to really also use this as a way of teaching our current students. And that becomes ever more important because we're also teaching ever more of our students in online classes. And so they can very easily get assignments um, that are very specific by using this you know, tool that allows them really to engage things in, in I think, really new um, and interesting ways. So it is there to kind of advance research, but also very much to advance um, our teaching opportunities. It's also built, and I said that early on, around a kind of growing recognition that not just on the level of graduate students, like you know this group is represented now, but more so really also for our undergraduate, so we in the humanities are lacking behind in providing what we call research opportunities to our undergraduate students, something that has been done much more frequently in the other schools, engineering and business and math and physics and so on and so forth, but we haven't really done that. 
And we're really doing a disservice, I think, by not offering these opportunities to our students. And now for various reasons, we are finally at the point that we can also entice undergraduates to participate in, in this project as well, who then also have a way of working really with a, like I said, very illustrious team, right, of experts here, but also with a very eclectic team where whatever their expertise or their interest is, is something that they can bring in. And so we're trying to attract over the summer um, some of our most talented um, students as a special program that allows us to bring students from our so-called honors, scholar, honors college into this. These are the scary kids, national merit scholars that have um, GPAs where you kind of think, how is that even possible? Um, but they somehow miraculously have done that. And for us, this is a way also, you know, quite obviously to bring in students into the study of the Holocaust who would not enroll in classes on the Holocaust because their curriculum is loaded with requirements. They don't have the bandwidth, but they're interested in this. And this is something that speaks to them. And it's also a method that we can use not just for the kind of visualization of the Holocaust or Dachau, but in any given point, we can always adopt and embrace a kind of different data set. Much of the data though, and this is, you know, Katie talked about it, is data, and we have to remain mindful of that, that was you know, created by the perpetrators. So the categories that are available to us are the categories that the perpetrators used in this particular case. And other you know, occurrences of, of this project, the earlier visualizations, we used in particular data from deportation lists. We used data that was then also made more available through the website of Yad Vashem and other places, more for memorial purposes that you could look up loved ones, uh, family relatives and so on and so forth. But you know, through, if you download it and put it through that process, then all of a sudden that same data can be also used for many other things. Yes, this is yeah, earlier I said, well, what I have is not life. You, you can see when, it's, when the, these earlier ones Alive. If you don't mind, could you just change like either year or, or country or something? You see it's kind of constantly then, and then if you hover over these lines, um, they always kind of constantly give you the exact numbers that are behind it. And then I think further down on that page, we also have, right, is that on the page? I think so. Uh, we have somewhere a historical, historical contextualization. So if you go into, let's say, 1944, June or something like that, then you get the kind of context of the Allies' invasion, and you kind of can think all of a sudden about the deportation within the context of what is happening otherwise. Um, you can kind of, what are we doing here right now? Other magical things, apparently. Um, you can kind of, you know, look again at the also down on individual deportations, one train. Um, we did a couple of case studies like that when we were interested on what's often called the last deportations, the last trains from, let's say, Paris or something like that, and to see who actually ended up on these last deportations. Here are many of our other endeavors. I mean, we're, uh, we edited on two more fabulous podcasts yesterday, one with Dean and another one with Glenn that we hopefully will released very soon, but in the midst of it, we realized that we've produced about 50 of them, you said? Um, and this all started during the pandemic when we were all a little lost and lonely at home and kind of tried to figure out ways to kind of stay connected. And early on, we just um, did podcasts about recently released movies about the Holocaust and discussed them. And then um, over the years, we expanded that. And this is another kind of thing that um, works in conjunction with the tool that we've been trying to um, uh, introduce today, and that is we created a uh, podcast from 1933 all the way to 1945, one for each one of the years, and for each one of them we ended up in a vigorous debate with each other about the quote-unquote one pivotal historical event of that year, which is obviously impossible, um, but it nevertheless provided an interesting way of breaking down the entire reign of the Third Reich into these very distinct units of years, and then to discuss what this you know, individual event meant in that particular um, year at the moment and how it came to you know, maybe be, um, 
acquire a different year for us. I think you said it so well, it was last night, when you were looking at 1938, you said their 1938 is not our 1938. And so we were trying to get at something similar with these podcasts. And we're using them again also in our classes. And so we're assigning, as we're going through the chronology, we're assigning these various podcasts um, also to our classes. And again, it becomes a way where um, the various students are, quote unquote, the co-producers of these various endeavors. And, we have a quasi-professional looking recording studio where we all right huddle beyond, behind our mics and all that. And uh, we find that this is a very, very engaging and very open-ended process, really, of trying to engage material that is far beyond the abilities of a traditional historian, um, but thereby hopefully also find new ways of making this material relevant and also of being able sometimes um, to track really stories that otherwise, like Katie you, uh, said in her example, otherwise would be lost in the kind of larger numbers, um, the scale, or also lost simply because there was no space really to, to acknowledge these types of sufferings after 45. As you will know, the politics in West Germany didn't dramatically change as far as the treatment of homosexuals were concerned, and therefore those 40 three that were liberated, were liberated in, into a world where they had to continue to be silent about themselves and were not allowed even often to, to talk about their experiences, nor to share it with even their extended families. There's a documentary that was made many, many years later that talks about that pain of that silence, so that to this day, actually, that part of, 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 of the Holocaust, of the persecution, is often under-acknowledged. I mean, if you go to Berlin, you kind of see this in lots of ways in the various memorials that exist so that there is nowadays greater reckoning, but it's something that's in the data, in other words, that we can tease out. I think you were early on there, you wanted to ask a question, so I'll, I think I'll end here and we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, raw data, oh, looking at the, the raw data that you used, the, the um, did the Germans have additional charges? In other words, a major charge, say, being a Jew, homosexual, Rassenschande, that you can pull out, but you only have one charge. There's another description, uh, Roma, homosexual, etc. It's indolent, so that you can pull out X and Y, not Z, etc. In this case, there's mostly only the data about the, the, you know, first, so to speak, reason why they were arrested, not multiple reasons. So they were, if they were arrested as political opponents, then that's most often the only category that we have. Yeah, that's true. Also, when they were logging them, I think they would try to write down everything they could. So in 19, in the section 175 violations, you'll see there's two examples of a German Jew who was also held under violation of 175. So wh whatever, we're kind of putting that um, Jewish category as a Nazi definition of race. But of course, in you know, 1942, they would have been held for that as well. So if you're doing a search, you can pull out different samples. Yeah, it's not even that. It's not that all prisoners would have been always categorized in exactly the right. same manner. There are some categories, I mean, uh, we kind of went into this a little bit, that are really confusing. Austria is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, up until 38, we're good as far as Austria is concerned. After 38, it gets really messy because Austrians are sometimes classified then as Germans, but sometimes as jo German Austrians. So we have more Austrian categories than, than we, we ever wanted. And so for now, we kind of maintained it in the way in which they were cataloged because we wanted to stay kind of in line with how these categories initially were applied. Uh, but it gets, for example, on that front, really confusing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, with Austrian, Austrian-German, German-Austrian, and so on and so forth. So sometimes you, this data doesn't always allow us to, to do all the things that we want to do. Um, but hopefully it will allow us to do some things that we otherwise would not have been able to do. Hi. 
Um, I've seen this data since you first started putting it up, and it's, it's amazing, really, how, how rich, much richer it has become. But my, my question is, you, you talked about asking questions. So because it has become much richer and more diverse, do you, in the way you are able to question it, do you use a load of different facets that you can work through? Because how do you actually get the question through to the data, so to speak? Well, I mean, this is like everything else that we do. It's um, we have the question first. You know, we often sit together, and the most famous thing that I would probably say always, oh, oops, there goes the theory. Um, because, well, it didn't really work so well what, what I was thinking or what, you know, one of us was thinking. So it's a very iterative process. It's not one go in already thinking that we know everything, but rather where we are trying to go at this in so many different ways that there's something that pops up that hadn't been you know, entirely noticeable for us. Um, you know, very clearly for, for today's presentation, we were all intent on showing these big turning points, 33, 38, 43. As it turns out, 43 is really not that significant as far as Dachau is concerned. 44 is, but not 43. Um, so in many ways, you know, some of the larger changes, for example, that Dean was talking about that are occurring in 43 are not so readily registering right away in the prisoner's lock of Dachau. There's a certain delay that is occurring. I want to add something to that. So working with two individuals that are coming from data analysis, and also for Angie and I and for Dr. Romer coming from a um, humanities perspective, there's some uh, friction maybe in those perspectives. And oftentimes when they're cleaning, they'll show me a visualization. I'm like, this makes no sense. Like, what, what are all of these categories? Or what is this, what are all these numbers for? So we talk in our, uh, our group work sessions about so we have this data analysis layer that we're putting over the data. And how can we come up with a lens or a, another layer that would be the humanities layer on top of that? And it's only through filtering the data through those different lenses that we can come to something that makes sense to all of you. To ask what kind of layer can we put over this data so that what we see on the other side can then be brought into the historical conversation. And this is why we have categories like arrest, region, race, because initially just putting this category, if I had shown you a visualization only of the category, it wouldn't have made any sense. So I, I think that's a, one of the most productive parts of working cross-disciplinary. Yes. Do you have escape prisoners there as well? Them in the, I don't think they're I don't think so, yeah. No, they are not categorized as especially. They left the record. <laughs> but I mean, a big impetus over the years has been of this, you know, it's this kind of challenge of scale. How do you really kind of create something that is flexible enough for you to see like a, the kind of what you could call the bird's eye view, like the comprehensive analysis over the years here, how you can see the kind of bands, how they're changing all the way down to being able to scale it down again and say, okay, within that group of 44, I'm really interested now in those that come from a particular region, let's say Yugoslavia, uh, Jewish, 44, and then to try to pick out individuals and maybe see if you can flesh out some of these individual stories and maybe map them out again as a way of you know, dropping all the way down to the individual case and then moving up again to the cohort and the group. And thereby also sometimes being able maybe to, I mean, this was very much behind your project, really being able to tell maybe the history of some victims that otherwise you couldn't. But the way by which you can still talk about them is in kind of in their clusters. You don't know much about the, individ the individuals, but you know something about their group and you can track them of how they ended up in this concentration system, where they were initially arrested and on what day and for what purpose and how they were shipped around and so on and so forth. So you can kind of do these smaller samples and cluster research of otherwise groups that are, you know, wouldn't any longer be able for us to, to talk about their experience in any kind of meaningful ways. So that's for me the biggest 
you know, promise, so to speak, of this tool that you can kind of have these uh, abilities to kind of go up and down, but also really coming back, coming to a system where um, you can, at any given point, manipulate the data in the ways in which it becomes visible to you in order to ask new questions. Yes? I'm being told this mic isn't working. Thank you. All right, I get the mic that doesn't work. <laughs> So, of course, Jehovah's Witnesses are there, but they're there as a, a prisoner category. And yet the Nazi intake forms included uh, a line for indicating a prisoner's religion. So the, is there a reason why the, did the data that you were provided with simply not include that? Because you would also have, you know, every religion in Germany is represented in the, in the concentration camps in that sense. So maybe you could explain why that particular category doesn't show up yeah. in this database. This one, I, th I think you just didn't have it turned on. Oh. Is it working now? Yes. I think Miracle. so. Yeah. Um, do you want me to answer? Anybody? The reason why we're not including other religions in this categorization is because they didn't show up in the data. So Jehovah's Witness and Jew were the only two religions that were listed. No one was listed under Christian or anything, so. Then we have time for one or two more questions and then we want to stay one there and then one all the way in the back, maybe. Um, you said that you use Python, I believe, to... Um, yes. I, I was just wondering like, what went into your decision to use Python, because um, at, at Clemson, my university, um, we use R. Uh, and I was just curious about the, you know, the advantages of Python over something like R. You're handing this one over. So R is usually used for statistical uh, purposes. So if you want to derive any statistics based, if, if there is any statistics involved, you use R. But in Python, there are a few libraries called Beautiful Soup, where uh, you are able to web scrap the data more easily and conveniently. So that is the reason we used Python instead of R. This web scrap scraping is also a lot of fun. Um, I unleashed you on a particular website that then, you know, when you do this, gets constantly hit, and so it was always down, right? <laughs> you overwhelmed that for a while. Yeah, given that we now understand that race is a social cultural construction and a false categorization, categorization of the human species, why put up on this database the use of the word race as opposed to some kind of titling such as racial category, which was a Nazi category, rather than just simply the word race, because in your, when you go to that column, look at all the gaps. Uh, you know, the answer is a very simple one. All these categories are Nazi categories. A social right, is a Nazi category. Defiler of race is a Nazi category. So we're just simply using, at this point of the project, the Nazi categories. These are the categories of the perpetrators because they are, I think, significant in so far as they dramatically change over the course of time. But they're obviously socially constructed categories. There is no such right. thing as a asocial in, in the ways in which the Nazis right. constructed For, it, as much as there's no, no such thing as, as a Jewish race in the way in which the Nazi not. constructed it. But for a person who first sees this visualization, isn't there an opportunity, and again, I, I don't see it, for what us classical historians call a footnote, that there should be a footnote with all of the title, titles explained somehow for, for the first look-see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really think this one's not working. Yeah, it wasn't just you. Uh, this is a great point. I'm really glad that you're bringing this up. And in the visualizations that we have published, this one is not technically published for uh, public consumption. We do make this distinction that these are Nazi categories. These are Nazi words that we're using. But also, I want to point out um, page five of this visualization, which is a further explanation of the abbreviations. And I think this helps provide a little bit more context and also show the broader picture of how the Nazis are almost obsessively putting labels on people and then treating them according to those labels. All right, thank you very much for being with us. And 
I just want to point out that these are for you to take home. I saw some of you taking pictures of these. Please take them with you. And, and also on your way out, just if you're curious about where we got this data from, you can uh, read a bit more about the source and also the people who have gone before us making this project possible.